on today's episode of The Virtual Couch. Sure, Halloween may be coming, but why playing the role of devil's advocate is not very helpful for your marriage. That and a lot of emotionally focused therapy, good old couples communication techniques coming up on The Virtual Couch. Hey, before we get started today, I do want to talk about my friends at BetterHealth.com. Now, I typically read emails that I receive from listeners, and those emails are fantastic. I think my point there was I wanted people to recognize that they are getting help through BetterHelp.com, specifically BetterHelp.com slash virtual couch. But I was listening to BetterHelp.com has ads on a lot of different uh, podcasts, a lot of my favorite podcasts. And I was listening to one of the, the reads of the ad and it was wonderful. It was fantastic. The data was there. But, you know, it kind of dawned on me, hey, I'm a therapist. Um, this is, I, I believe everybody could use a little bit of therapy in their life, truly, to be able to process difficult things to be able to go to work through things that they've always kind of st- been stuck on or things that have just kicked around in their head that they're afraid to talk about or things that they're even aware of that are holding them back from living an incredible life. And I know part of that struggle can be finding a therapist. It can be if there aren't a lot of therapists in your area. And let's be honest, it can be for a lot of people, there's still a very negative stigma around therapy. And it can be the process of having to go to a therapist, worrying about who I will see, who will, who will I see in the parking lot or in the waiting room or what if the receptionist gives me the stink eye, whatever it is, I understand. So that's where betterhelp.com comes in. So if you go to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch, you can set up an account there and they have a very broad range of expertise. I've looked through this. They have people that are um, amazing therapists and with treating OCD, treating anxiety, depression, uh, anxiety. I said anxiety, but uh, lots of people that can treat anxiety there, but they have different modalities. My favorite one, acceptance and commitment therapy. They have um, acceptance and commitment therapy therapists, cognitive behavioral therapists. They have behavioral therapy. They have so many options there. But the key is when you go, when you sign up, when you go to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch, you do fill out some assessment paperwork and they do a very, very phenomenal job at matching you with a therapist that is going to most likely click. But here's the cool part. If, if the therapist, if you don't click with the therapist, they make it very painless to even change therapists. So there's a broad range of expertise in their counselor network, which might not be available in your local your local area. It's available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and you can send a message to your therapist and they will get uh, you'll get a timely and thoughtful response. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't necessarily have to come sit in the uncomfortable waiting room and they you can start communicating often in less than 24 hours. I'll be super honest. I I have a very blessed um, practice. I I I get uh, referrals literally daily from the podcast, from uh, people that I've worked with before. And it, it honestly, it breaks my heart that sometimes I feel like I can't even, I don't have enough time to even get back to people. And I feel so bad about that. And that's where I honestly love the fact that you can start communicating with somebody in 24 to 48 hours. If you have tried to find a therapist, sometimes you'll know that you might not hear back from them and you're ready. You you want help. So they're, they're committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches and it's easy. It's free to change counselors if you need it. It's more affordable, I'll be honest, than traditional offline counseling and they have financial aid. So they really want you to start living a happier life today. And I'm going to be honest, I do too. So please go to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch. If you do that, you will receive 10% off your first month's service. And, uh, and, and now I can't lie. If you go to betterhelp.com, um, slash virtual couch and you go through there, then, you know, that, sure, it's a, there, there is going to be a little something that can help me with the cost of the podcast. So I would be grateful if you went through betterhelp.com slash virtual couch. All right. Um, Go do it today. It's time to start getting help. Betterhelp.com slash virtual couch. Tony Overbay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified mindful habit coach, writer, speaker, husband, father of four, ultra marathon runner, and creator of The Path Back, an online pornography recovery program that is helping people like you 
reclaim their lives from the harmful effects of pornography. If you or anybody that you know is struggling to put pornography behind them once and for all, and trust me, it can be done in a strength-based, hold the shame, become the person you always knew you could be way, then please head over to pathbackrecovery.com, and there you can download a short ebook that describes five common mistakes that people make when trying to get rid of pornography once and for all. Again, it can be done, and that is pathbackrecovery.com. Please visit Virtual Couch on Instagram. I'm doing weekly question and answer sessions, a little Instagram TV, so follow along there, and you can find the Virtual Couch and Tony Overbay Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist pages on Facebook. And if you like anything about the podcast, please share it or subscribe it or rate it or review it, all that good stuff. And one more thing, head over to TonyOverbay.com and sign up there to find out more about a lot of exciting things that are coming on, programs, books, all kinds of fun stuff, uh, newsletter. Um, I promise not to sell your list. As a matter of fact, I barely actually send anything to your email address, something I actually need to do a little better about, and uh, a lot more that is coming up on the release of a book that I co-authored with a gentleman named Josh Shea, and the book is called He's a Porn Addict, Now What?, an expert and a former addict to answer your questions. And I'm playing the role of the expert and former virtual couch guest Josh Shea, who has already authored a best-selling book called The Addiction Nobody Will Talk About, Writes as the Addict. I have still not listened or, or read or seen any of his answers, and I'm kind of excited about just to see what he said from the uh, the part of The Addict. We have read a lot of the advanced um, press or advanced reviews, advanced information on the book. And it's, uh, it really is, I think it's going to help a lot of people. So I'm really excited to get that out. So let's get to today's episode. I'm really excited about this one. I think that I say that about all the episodes, but this one, I'm doing a little bit of timely information as well. This is the week of Halloween. If you are a, a United States um, listener or anyone that does celebrate the holiday of Halloween. And uh, I just, you know, last year, I think when I did a Thanksgiving episode, I did some Thanksgiving fun facts and actually heard quite a bit of feedback from that. So I was just doing a little bit of digging about Halloween in general. According to history.com, the Halloween we know today can trace its roots back to the ancient Celtic end of harvest festival called Sam Hain. During Samhain, people would light bonfires and wear costumes to ward off evil spirits. And then in the 8th century, in an effort to spread Christianity, Pope Gregory III decreed November 1st as All Saints Day and incorporated some of the rituals of Samhain. But All Saints Day was also called All Hallows. So the night before, when the traditional Samhain festival used to take place in Celtic regions, it was then called All Hallows' Eve. So the night before Halloween, um, this is a kind of a fun thing too, I found uh, just some random facts about Halloween from all over the place. This one, young children in Des Moines, Iowa, hit the streets for what's called Beggar's Night. So according to an article in the Des Moines Register, the event began in 1938 as a way to prevent vandalism and give younger children a safer way to enjoy Halloween. Beggar's Night is similar to regular trick-or-treating, except kids are required to tell a joke or a poem or perform a trick for a treat. And the best part? The jokes are quoted, uh, quote, notoriously groan-worthy. So that that caused me to go back. If you didn't hear an episode I did a month or two ago on humor and therapy, that is one that uh, I have people talk about those groaner of jokes more than anything. Um, even people in my family, clients that come in, some emails that I've received talking about if you I linked a site called boardpanda.com and it was 52 of the best two line jokes and they are apparently um, researched evidence based jokes and here's some that I didn't get to in that humor based uh, or that humor episode but if we're talking about no jokes being notoriously grown worthy for this beggar's night if anyone is listening from the Des Moines Iowa area and I actually went and looked at the stats and there are people that do and uh, literally in Des Moines here are a few that jokes that are definitely grown worthy that I think will work great for beggar's night uh, that I did not include in my previous episode on humor and therapy here's the one just say no to drugs. Well, if I'm talking to my drugs, I already probably said yes. Um, another one that is notoriously grown worthy says, I came up with a new word yesterday, plagiarism. Kind of had to think about that one. And this one, I don't know why this one made me laugh so hard. And I think about this one often. Uh, here's the joke. I have a step ladder, but that's because my real ladder left when I was a kid. I really feel like I need one of those rim shots, that sort of thing. Uh, one more fun fact from Halloween because my wife is a big fan of candy corn. Candy corn was originally called chicken feed, though many would argue that candy corn tastes like chicken feed. That is not how it got its original name. Created in 1880 by George Renninger, it was sold to the masses by the Golitz Confectionery Company, which is now called Jelly Belly Co., at the turn of the century, because corn is what was used to feed chickens. The creation was called chicken feed, and the box was marked with a colorful rooster. 
So there you go. There's some fun facts about Halloween. Now, with the concept of uh, or kind of talking about Halloween, that does lead into today's episode. And this is an episode on couples communication. But if you saw in the title, I used the phrase or talked about the phrase, the devil's advocate. So I want to cover quickly where that phrase or the meaning of the phrase, the devil's advocate comes from. I think it is really fascinating. And I'm going to work this into an EFT, an emotionally focused therapy, uh, couples issue, couples communication issue, because I get to hear about someone who is just, they, they just say they're just playing devil's advocate often in therapy. And I want to kind of talk about what that looks like as well as how that might not be the most productive thing for communication between a couple. So first, this is from the website phrases.org.uk. And this is under meanings, meanings of the devil's advocate. And I really didn't know this. This is kind of fascinating. What's the meaning of the phrase the devil's advocate? It says figuratively one who takes a contrary position for the sake of testing an argument or just to be perverse. And then what is the origin of the phrase the devil's advocate? The term the devil's advocate was brought into English in the 18th century from the medieval Latin expression advocate, uh, advocatus diabli, which I feel like I just did some sort of Harry Potter spell. To describe someone as a devil's advocate now is to suggest that they are mischievous and contradictory, being contrary for the sake of it. And I do feel often in the, where the framing that I'll use a little bit later here, where that does, that is what it feels like when a partner is saying to their spouse, hey, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate. So, in medieval Europe, the devil's advocate wasn't seen so negatively. It was like a chamberlain or a cord wainer. It was actually a job title. I thought that was really fascinating. So, the original devil's advocate was a real person. There are various mentions in the Vatican records dating from the early 1500s of an informal role called Diaboli Advoticus. In 1587, the administration of Pope Sixtus V, and I love how in this uh, article it says, disappointingly, there has yet to be a Sixtus VI. But Sixtus, Pope Sixtus V in 1587 established the formal post of promoter of the faith, known colloquially as Advoticus Diaboli, which surely must have been the same role as Diaboli Advoticus. The job description wasn't especially onerous until someone was nominated for either beatification and canonization, at which point the devil's advocate then was expected to drop a list of arguments against the nominee becoming blessed or canonized. So that's that's fascinating. So when someone was about to be blessed or when they were about to be canonized, if they were be if they were about to become a saint uh, basically, beatification or canonization, then this role, this person, this person who played the role of devil's advocate was expected to drop a list of things against the nominee just to make sure that they had covered everything before this person was beatified or canonized. So the first time that the current form of the expression was used in print appears to be in the 1760 humorous text Imposters detected. Whereas part of the humorous text, someone apparently rose up and played the true part of the devil's advocate. Now, here is where this podcast concept originated long ago when I was truly beginning to see a lot more couples. And just a quick reminder originally, I would see a couple of couples a week and it felt fairly taxing. And now I see sometimes 20 or more couples in a week. And while the degree of difficulty will still definitely be higher on occasion with a couple, because sometimes one of the members of the pair, or sometimes both, are still just there because they want me to tell the other person that they are right. Or they call it triangulation in therapy, where um, they're trying to triangulate and get me on the side of, of one of the partners and against the other person. But while the degree of difficulty, again, still higher, I, I guess I feel a lot of satisfaction when a couple really does click because that's when they see the patterns of negative behaviors or these negative communication patterns that have been keeping them stuck. They they kind of get to see them from the other person's point of view. That's really the goal. It goes back to that concept of teaching empathy. And when it clicks, then they sort of get a glimpse of this entirely new relationship. And it, it is exciting. It still takes a lot of practice, even when they have the fundamentals of this new emotionally focused or EFT type of relationship or communication, but it is absolutely worth it. So I remember one of the first couples, again, to this day, and I've changed things for the sake of confidentiality. It's been quite a long time. So again, and some of the details will be changed, but nothing that will affect the meaning of the story. So I remember one of these couples in the situation, the wife was feeling a bit overwhelmed and she was away from her family. She had a lot of little kids. He worked a lot and she missed her family. She enjoyed being a mom, but she just felt kind of isolated or alone. 
And she really wanted to talk about moving back to where her family lived. And the husband had finally found a really good job. And he had been looking for a good job for a long, long time. It wasn't like just uh, trying to find a job, but he had been in jobs that he didn't feel very satisfied or they weren't necessarily making ends meet. So now he had a job that he enjoyed. He was making ends meet, but she was away from her family. So that's the way that they came to me. So we were having good conversations. And in the first session or two, we kind of brought some awareness to each other's plight. I was trying to lay out the, the role or the model of this emotionally focused or EFT type of communication. But being key here, we weren't trying to fix it. And we weren't trying to judge the other person's um, the information that they were kind of bringing into therapy. We, we call them these emotional bids. So we weren't trying to judge the information that they were presenting because remember in the world of EFT, and if uh, maybe you need a quick refresher on EFT, you can go back. There's several episodes of uh, podcast episodes where I've gone into a lot of detail on EFT. It, well, and actually, um, you know, I really, this is something that is passionate to me. So let me do a little bit of digging and um, I'm going to pause. The, the the podcast and I'll be right back and we're going to go quick deep dive on EFT again for anybody that's just joining me or people that would like a little bit more background. So uh, hang tight. Okay, we are back. So um, I dug up some stuff off of a website called goodtherapy.org and uh, I will post the link to that in the show notes. But here we go. Theory of emotionally focused therapy. This is one that I really enjoy the way they lay this out. The theory of emotionally focused therapy, or EFT, is based on attachment theory. And attachment theory is the concept that people are made healthier by emotional contact and a need to feel safe in their connections to others. And those concepts help guide the whole development of this EFT approach. And I do highly recommend, if you got a second or a minute or after this, go back and listen to episode 129. I'm not usually very good at remembering the episode numbers, but that's one where I talk about the science behind EFT and primarily based off of a book by Sue Johnson called Love Sense. And there are some really good quotes out of that book that are about the need, why we have such a need to be attached to someone else. And that's why it can be very, feel isolating or lonely when we are in a relationship, but we feel often like we're on our own. So emotionally focused therapy is also based on the concept that that distress and intimate relationships often related to deeply rooted fears of abandonment as in an individual's emotional response to these fears, and they may be harmful to the relationship, uh, each of the partners, and put a strain on the relationship. So when an intimate partner, when intimate partners are not able to meet each other's emotional needs, they become stuck in negative patterns of interaction and driven by ineffective attempts to get each other to understand their emotions and related needs. That is so key. Both people basically fall into this pattern of trying to be heard, and the way that they try to be heard is not very productive. So one person might get angry and the other person might shut down. Or one person might try to say, well, you do this. And so what's their partner going to do? They're going to say, well, you do that and you do this. And so they call that tit for tat. And so, and, and sometimes it, uh, and I like this article says, it might be difficult for outsiders or therapists and sometimes even those in the relationship to understand why the emotional arguments and the confrontations causing difficulty in the relationship start and can continue to occur. But the theory behind emotionally focused therapy considers the key principle in conflict among couples is, is insecurity and the attachment that one has with their partner. And the insecurities mean that the partners find themselves concerned by these deep questions. Here we go. Do you really love me? Am I important to you? Are you committed to your to our relationship? Can I trust you? Can I count on you? Are you my person? So and so on. So emotionally focused therapy helps people address these attachment related insecurities and learn how to interact with their romantic partners in more loving and responsive and emotionally connected ways, which results in a more secure attachment. And when you have that secure attachment, that becomes your base. When you can go to your person and you can just share anything, any of your struggles or hopes or dreams, if you feel isolated or alone or like you want to move back to where your family lives lives, any of those things. If you can go back to your partner and share that information and know that your partner is going to be there for you and they're going to say, tell me more. What is that like for you? Help me understand what what I might be doing that maybe doesn't feel supportive. Then that is when things just kind of click. They flip. So emotionally focused therapy draws on a gentleman named Carl Rogers. It's called his person-centered therapy, which is a non-directive approach to treatment in which people uh, in treatment often gain a better self-understanding through speaking to the therapist who listens carefully and empathetically. So then emotionally focused therapy expands on techniques from this person-centered therapy, and then it uses, and this is key, scientifically validated theory of adult bonding to help couples understand not only their 
emotions, but also how the back and forth patterns of emotional reactions operate and affect the relationships. So there are very good um, techniques used in emotionally focused therapy that will help. And it basically involves these nine treatment steps. I don't think I've ever really gone into detail on the nine treatment steps. But in the initial sessions of treatment, the first uh, the first four steps of this nine step process, the therapist will then assess interaction styles of the couple and will help de-escalate conflict. And then in the middle phases of treatment, uh, the therapist will and the couple work together to find ways to form these stronger bonds or new stronger bonds in the relationship. And then seven through nine, the, st- the steps of seven through nine, um, they, they're kind of uh, the changes are consolidated and so that things become really tangible and you can do this EFT stuff out in the wild. So a couple might start therapy by learning ways to de-escalate conflict about a commonly debated topic like finances, for example. But then the couple begins to learn ways to express deeper feelings, often covered up by common relationship conflicts, such as a lack of trust. So when couples are able to identify and talk about these deeper feelings with compassion, then they're able to form deeper bonds. That's the cool part. So if you know that you, let's say that there is the issue of finances in the relationship, and uh, and let's just say that the husband feels like the wife isn't very aware of the finances, and I'm going very you know generic. I could flip the genders, I could flip the, but just given this, this is an example. So. Um, the husband might say, yeah, man, I don't feel like she appreciates how hard I work. I feel like she isn't, uh, you know, that she doesn't really um, take good care of the money, that sort of thing. I mean, I do hear this one often. And so typically the wife will, at that point, she kind of shuts down. So in the EFT world, if we look at that as his emotional bid, he's being vulnerable, he puts out that emotional bid. My job as the therapist is often to first identify the negative communication pattern. And this one, it's pretty clear. If he wants to talk about finances, um, he, you know, she, he's going to pursue, she's going to withdraw. She's going to shut down. And so sometimes if he pushes and pushes and pushes, here comes another uh, pattern that can happen where she might then explode with anger. So and then uh, and then he's going to either come back with anger as well. And she might say, well, hey, you're not perfect either. You spend money here. And then he's like, oh, yeah, well, you spend money here. And so we've got this tip for task. You can see how these patterns uh, develop and how they just continue to keep the conversations not being very productive. So in the EFT world around... um, finances, for example, I would try and help, let's just say again, in this situation, if the husband says something about finances and not feeling like he's appreciated or that she isn't uh, taking care of the money, um, that uh, that she is spending frivolously, that sort of thing, it, you know, you really try to help the person that is putting out the emotional bid feel safe and here's how they feel. I feel like I'm not appreciated, that sort of thing. And then you have the person hearing it. In this case, it would be the wife to try and have empathy for the fact that if he really does feel like he's working hard, he's working all of these hours, and that he's not appreciated, that that would be hard. Here comes empathy. And that that must be difficult. And so that's why it's hard for him to kind of say this in therapy. So if, if you can even just get that part done where the wife can say, okay, I can understand that that would be frustrating to feel like you put in a lot of effort and work. But, uh, but feel like it's not appreciated and that, uh, that, you know, the, the money is kind of going wherever it's going. So take a look at that right out of the gate. That's a different interaction. That's a different communication style. The husband feels heard. He feels like he's got himself. He's put out this emotional bid and the wife didn't attack. She didn't withdraw. So she's maybe learned a little from an empathetic standpoint of what that feels like for him. Here's where the magic comes in. And I really mean this. So now in in, in the EFT world, we're going to do that right back the other way. So now the wife is going to share her what I call truths. And so now that she has understood where he's coming from or tried to do have some empathy there and he feels heard already, we haven't shut down. That's what's incredible about this. So now she gets to share that, you know, here's what that's like for me. I feel like often there isn't um, as much money as, as I think that you believe there is. Or, you know, I do work within a budget, but I feel like there's always this extraneous expenses and I don't feel like those are necessarily taken into account. Or I feel like, you know, if I do say that I had to spend a little extra money here or there, that you get really angry. So at some point, I don't even want to bring it up. And so in my mind, I just feel like, okay, maybe next month I'll be able to find a little extra that can cover what I spent this month, and then we won't even have to talk about it. So really, it boils down to there's just the lack of this communication because both parties don't feel heard. And in this scenario, um, the husband feels like he's he's not being heard or not being appreciated. But meanwhile, the wife feels like she hasn't been it's not a safe environment to kind of say, hey, you know, I know that we we had this much allotted for whatever the expense was, but it came up to be more. And instead of when she presents that to the husband, instead of him saying, hey, t- all right, tell me what we're tell me what I'm missing, because, you know, um, 
we're, we're in this together. We have this secure attachment. Uh, you know, the person, the, the husband in this scenario might, uh, the wife might have examples in the past where if she has brought up financial issues where the husband's gotten a little bit angry or upset or he's withdrawn. And so, uh, you know, she's maybe going to shut down. And so you can see how these patterns occur. And so once both partners feel heard, you know, at that point, then, you know, we're, we're going to start working toward resolution. We're not even trying to just do compromise because compromise is not necessarily a nice evidence based uh, um, concept either. In compromise and relationships, a lot of times both people feel like they've they've kind of given up on some things that are important to them. What I love about in the EFT world is that when you can have productive conversations and they don't shut down, then both people can kind of share what's really difficult for them. Um, for the husband, it might be, well, I do feel like, you know, I hear you. And I feel like, though, whenever we've tried to put a budget together, that neither one of us really stick to it. Or I feel, you know, if the husband's being really emotionally vulnerable, he can say, all right, I, I don't want to have to create a budget because in my family, the budget ruled everything. And I felt like we were really handcuffed. You know, so you really get to this point where you try and, and just be able to express what you're feeling and know your partner is going to be there to hear you. But the bigger key is that your partner is not going to say, I can't believe you just said that. Or, you know, they're, they're going to say, all right, hey, I appreciate you sharing that with me. I mean, that, that's what that's what true empathy looks like. So, boy, that was a nice uh, deep dive into, um, you know, the uh, concept of EFT. So let me kind of get back to the example that I was talking about. So this couple had identified their negative interaction pattern. So she would pursue. She would uh, say that I really want to move. I'm really frustrated. I feel alone and isolated. And then he would withdraw, literally would just kind of shut down. So if they became engaged in an argument every now and again, if, if it would continue in this pattern, it would break away from this and they would go into this tit for tat. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, well, you do this. Oh, yeah, well, you do that. But here's where things got interesting. So we, we get locked into this nice EFT modality and we're starting to just bring awareness. So she's sharing how difficult it can be to be uh, what she almost feels like a single mom at times because of how much he works. And she has these young kids and she doesn't really feel connected in her community. Community and she really misses her family. And so he's hearing her, you know, and it's hard. It's hard because in his mind, and, and this is what, this is what shuts communication down in his mind. He's hearing these things like, um, Hey, your job doesn't matter. Or I, you know, I don't care that you found a job that you really enjoy or that you are providing financially. You know, this is, he, that's what he's hearing. And, and she's not saying that there's the key, but that's the kind of stuff he's hearing. So that's typically why he would withdraw or shut down. So, again, um, he just kind of says in one of the sessions, well, let me just play devil's advocate. Let me just play the role of devil's advocate. And so, I, at that point then, he starts to then say, he's basically breaking down her arguments. Well, you know, you say you want to be by your family, but here's this situation and this situation. Or with the the amount of money that I'm making right now and, and how much our house costs and where the market is, you know, I don't, you know, you really can't believe that we're going to be able to find something else or that it's going to be like this. Or I know that you've said that you like our home. And so again, he's saying, I'm just playing devil's advocate. And at that point, she kind of looks over at me and says, you know, when we get to this part of a conversation, if it ever gets to this point, I know that we're done. And then I kind of said, okay, tell me more. And she said that whenever he gets to the point of playing devil's advocate, she knows that he's just trying to break down her arguments, find holes in her arguments. And so she now just shuts down at that point because she knows that, you know, resistance is futile, that she cannot speak her mind and that she's not going to be able to communicate what she really feels and that he's essentially just trying to find different ways to break down her argument. So, um, you know, I, I listen, I hear all the things that he's saying, uh, that, and it does, and I can understand that. I do have empathy for her, that it does feel like she is feeling like things are, are that, that it doesn't really matter what she says, that he's going to eventually say, well, there you go. So we, we can't, you know, we can't move. I need to continue doing exactly what I'm doing. So here's where, again, what I really appreciate is, so we really dig deep and what is she hearing? She's feeling, she's hearing that, uh, that her opinions don't matter. And she's feeling like it doesn't really matter what she says that he's going to get his way. So then we kind of break down where, what, where this concept of devil's advocate is coming from for him. And he talked about growing up, having arguments picked apart. Um, I believe I, he may have even had an attorney as a father, that sort of thing. So his his you know his parents loved to say, "All right, let's play devil's advocate," and they were they were going to pick apart his arguments. And the more we talked about it, and the safer he felt, the more he did feel like that his dad would truly go to devil's advocate mode on him, and that one hundred percent needed needed 
that he needed to do whatever it was his dad was telling him to do when it kind of all boiled down to things. So he was able to kind of realize that, okay, there had been a pattern growing up where he had a father that would play devil's advocate, but he also heard her when she, when, when she was saying, I feel like I don't even have a say if you pull the devil's advocate card. And it was just, it was a pretty tender moment when he said, man, I remember feeling that way as well. And at that point, then he said, hey, I'm really sorry. That's not what I'm trying to do. And so the the key, what happens there is, no, from that point, we weren't going to fix it. They weren't going to decide to move in that session or even in the next session. But now we'd identified that she just wanted to be heard. She wanted to be heard of how difficult things were for her on a day-to-day basis. He then wanted to be heard. He validated her and he was grateful that she had shared that. And he even gave her, you know, thanks so much for all that you're doing for our family. And I really appreciate that. But then he also got to share his truths of what it felt like to have this job where he felt like he was doing something that he really enjoyed, what it felt like to provide for his family. It had been a long time since he had been able to. And so they both just got to this place where the goal was just to be heard. And the more that you feel like you're heard, then the more you start to just feel like that attachment is becoming secure. And again, here's the part that gets a little bit tricky is that we're not going to fix that. You know, if you ask me now, did they move? Did they not move? Um, I don't even know because once we got the communication pattern back intact, then they just felt like, okay, you know what? We need to just secure up this attachment. So for the next little while, months, years, however long it's going to be, now we just know that we can both be heard and, uh, and we can be frustrated and we can be sad and we can be angry and we can feel lonely and we can do all of these things in concert with one another that I know that, that he's going to be there for me if I say, man, here's how my day went. And he's going to say, hey, tell me what that's like. I mean, w- tell me what you did today. Tell me where you went emotionally. And then at that point, she feels heard. And then if he even just says that, hey, is there anything I can do? Or even at times now, he will even say, all right, now that you feel heard, it's hard for me but because I still want to go into this devil's advocate mode or it's it's hard for me not to want to just kind of um, bring up some questions about some of the things that you're you're asking. Would that be okay? And what a different uh, relationship that they have now because now she knows I can dump to him. He's a safe place. And once he hears her, a lot of those devil's advocate questions have kind of gone anyway, but he can still then say, all right, are you okay if I, if I do ask some questions or, you know, my brain is just wanting to go into this devil's advocate mode. Would that be all right? Sometimes she says no and they have a little laugh about it, but other times uh, that, uh, you know, she kind of says, okay, go, you know, go ahead, ask me questions, that sort of thing. Um, and I had, you know, I even had a, I had another client in the not uh, so distant past who also had been talking about a family event where they felt that they weren't included and uh, their spouse, you know, bless their hearts were doing their best to say, you know, hey, tell me more. That must be frustrating. But then she felt like the 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 spouse still did kind of go in and do a little bit of defending of uh, of his family and not as much of validating of her emotions. Uh, at that point, she had reached out to one of her siblings, and one of her siblings just said, you know, really, you know, hey, tell me, tell me what that's like. Tell me why you're frustrated, um, and just tell me more. And uh, they they just sat there and and basically until she felt like she had been heard and felt like there really wasn't much more that she could even say. And at that point, you know, the, the, the sibling said, is there anything I can do? I mean, in essence, in my mind, I always say it's the, hey, do you want me to go get the pitchforks? Let's go storm the village. But when somebody feels heard, I think a lot of times their reaction is going to be, no, you know, pitchforks aren't necessary. It's just good to be able to dump. And uh, I know it's going to work out. And, and I thought that was one of the key things that happened out of this, this example, where when, this, the, when, the, when the spouse felt heard by um, his or her sibling, trying to be so, uh, what's uh, again, um, ethical, um, not uh, violating any confidentiality, um, but uh, when they felt heard by his or her sibling, when uh, they felt like they were they were heard, that they had gotten all their emotions out, then they really did feel. They, they sat right here in my office and said, no, I really did feel like I was going to be okay because I knew it was going to be okay. You know, I knew that there were a lot of uh, moving pieces in the family dynamic. I knew we were going to see all these people again at some point, And I just wanted somebody to say, yeah, that stinks. That really does. And I know that can be really hard for spouses, um, whether it's the husband or the wife. I know at times, especially when we're talking about maybe our spouse's family, that uh, if, if we're frustrated with them, that it can be hard to tell our spouse that, hey, your mom really ticked me off uh, over the weekend. And all we want at times is for our spouse to say, 
I know, you know, or tell me what that's like, or I can tell that was frustrating for you. And, and I just really appreciate all that you're doing. You know, I, I appreciate uh, your patience and I know that must be hard. And, and a lot of times that's all you need to say, not the, well, you know, what do you expect? You know, she was frustrated or, you know, or, or, well, did you think about what that's like for her? Or, well, that, you know, I've, recently I've had a couple of people that are doing the, you know, well, that's, uh, that's not very Christ-like or those sort of things. And again, those are fixing and judgment statements. Those are not statements that are going to bring us closer together as a couple. Uh, those are statements that are going to make the other person feel like they're, they're doing something wrong, like they're, they're bad. And here's the thing that's pretty amazing. Let's say that, uh, let me go back to this, this, uh, hey, that's not very Christ-like example that, uh, that gets pulled up a lot. Um, let's say that the, the partner, let's say it's the wife in this scenario. Let's say that she's not being very Christ-like. Um, guess what? She knows. Uh, she knows she's not. That's part of why she's so frustrated. And so all she wants is for her husband to hear her, to understand and to just, and just sit there with her and say, Hey, I know that you're not necessarily being treated the way you want to be, or it sounds like that's really hard, or, you know, I just appreciate all that you're doing and, uh, not to just go in and say, Hey, you're not being very Christ-like because what that does is that just says you're doing this wrong. You know, it puts them on their heels. When someone feels heard and validated, that's when they can get to the point where they're going to say things like, do you think, uh, I don't know, do you think I could handle this better? You know, they're only going to get to that point if they feel heard or validated. So that's kind of the goal that I had today with even just bringing up this concept of devil's advocate, because I feel like that that role of devil's advocate is often just a role where a, a spouse, a partner is trying to pick apart the reality or trying to pick apart the arguments of their of their spouse. Your goal is to, to improve your relationship with your spouse. And, uh, and if it's not, I, I don't feel very bad of saying that should be the goal. And the way that that goal is attained is to have empathy and compassion and hear your partner. This is a very long game. This is not just a marathon. This is an ultra marathon. This is a hundred mile race. This is a 200 mile race. It's not a one time around the track. It's not even a mile race. Your relationship is a super long ultra marathon. And as someone who has run incredibly long, super long ultra marathons, they are some of the most satisfying races that, that I have ever done in my entire life. There are many, many walls that you hit. There are plenty of ups and downs. There are times where it's dark. There are times where you feel tired and exhausted. But those times when things are clicking are just absolutely incredible. And the only way to get there is to be able to hear your partner, to feel like you guys, as Sue Johnson says, are in this dyadic collaboration, this dance of where the two of you feel like you are, are going through this together. Because guess what? You are. You're married. You're in a relationship. So the last thing you need to be doing is trying to break down the other person's reality, period. If your partner can't come to you and say, Hey, I, I, I feel, um, I, 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 you know, I feel like we can't talk about finances or intimacy or parenting. Then you have to say, I am so sorry. I want our relationship to last. I want our relationship to be, um, you know, edifying. I want one plus one to equal three. So tell me what you're feeling. And I promise you, I'm going to turn off my fixing and judgment brain. And if I can't do it, then let's go to a therapist. Let's find somebody who can help us. And uh, use this emotionally focused therapy framework so that we can have productive communication because, because it is going to work. I promise you and with every fiber of my being, it's going to work. So, um, I hope that you have a wonderful Halloween if that is something that you celebrate, that sort of thing. And, uh, I hope that you will then take that, uh, take a look at that role as devil's advocate is, um, probably not the best way to build a relationship full of empathy and trust with your partner. And, uh, and at this point, um, I highly recommend go find a, a good therapist who, um, works with couples, who specializes in couples. If you're having an, a hard time having these, uh, communication or your communication breaks down with the tip for tat or the pursue withdrawal or the isolation or all of these sort of things, there are ways to overcome that. And I just hope that you'll get help as soon as you can. Okay, don't forget to send me any questions you have, but you can shoot them to contact at tonyoverbay.com or contact at pathbackrecovery.com or through the contact form on my website. If uh, you have questions or topics you'd like to be addressed in a future episode, or if you're interested in having me come speak to your group or organization, congregation, that sort of thing, that would be great doing a whole lot more of that as well. Or if you've got a podcast or something, I would love to be a guest. I really enjoy um, I enjoy helping other uh, fellow podcasters out. So um, without any further ado, let me bring back the wonderful, the talented, the uh, 
former Virtual Couch guest, Aurora Florence, who just had a Kickstarter funded for her project, The Anxious Taxidermist. It is amazing. I can't wait to uh, talk with her more about that in an upcoming episode. So, uh, but here's her song, It's Wonderful. Compressed emotions flying past Our heads and out the other end The pressures of the daily grind It's wonderful Elastic waste and rubber ghost I'm floating past the midnight hour They push aside the things that matter most It's wonderful Strengths and 